Hi, I'm Len Cutter. You're with us tonight at Cutter & Cutter Fine Art in Drizzly, St. Augustine, Florida. For those who love art, this is going to be a good evening for you. Uh, as you'll see as, as Scott pans here, we've got a, a lovely crowd of folks who are devotees of the artist Dean Mitchell. This is a special night for him. The, uh, the artwork on most of our walls throughout and in our show, our beautiful show windows are from Dean Mitchell. And Dean is a special friend of Cutter & Cutter Fine Art. We've represented him for many, many years. For those of you who know who he is, you're going to be meeting him in just a few minutes. And for those of you who don't know Dean, uh, we'll try to have uh, Scott pan some of the works of art, and as Dean is speaking to us, he's going to focus in on several pieces that may be of interest. Thanks for your time. Thank you for being here. We'll see you in a minute. Well, well, you're the only house. We're the only trailer. <laughs> <laughs> they, uh, that's what I mean. It's just that they're, they're so good. Yeah. 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 We have champagne, and we're like, okay, well, we're going to move this one over here, and we'll move this one over here. And I'm like, yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 And then, uh, no, and then I can. Let's get it by the burning down. Yeah. <laughs> We're going to be introducing the fabulous artist and wonderful friend of Cutter and Cutter Fine Art, Dean Mitchell. So if you'll gather with us toward the middle of the gallery and do remember that any of, any of you that have any questions, our staff is impeccable and probably the best in the well, let the artist say it best in the United States of America. All right, I'll say it. Who's that problem with? That had to be one of my sons and partners. There is no question. We are in the presence of one of America's greatest living watercolorists. His work, uh, we've represented Dean for many, many years. Um, they told me to try not to be boring, and I won't be boring. Many of you who know Dean and know my relationship with him <clears throat> know that it started at a dinner, uh, and the people at the table put the two of us side by side, not realizing that our personalities are different, and they'll never get along. 45 minutes after I sat down, we, had shook, we shook hands, and we need to represent Dean Mitchell. And it, I was right then, and Dean, I hope you feel you were right at that dinner. But we are so proud to represent this man and his artwork and his career. And I look at, I look at Dean and us as a career. We have some of the greatest artists in the world, and Dean is certainly one of them. And Dean is indispensable to what we do. If you're interested in fine art, you want to know who Dean Mitchell is. I know people are watching, they tell me they're watching in France and Czechoslovakia and Waco, Texas. I don't know <laughs> what that meant. But the artwork of Dean Mitchell is something that you need to see. And uh, I'd like to ask Dean, Dean, would you mind coming up and saying hello? Uh, Daddy, uh, okay. Dad, good. Dad, thank you, sweetheart. Thank you. The children love their daddy, that's obvious, but so do we and so do the collectors. Uh, and we have many collectors that are devoted to what you do, Dean. And uh, you know, as an art dealer, we are devoted to what you do. And you know, I wish I could have you listen to some of the conversations Dean and I have on the phone, and I'm going to let the cat out of the bag. This is a very serious artist. And when, when Dean, if you want a conversation that can go anywhere, deep intellectual conversations, this is the man. But if you, who? It's alive. If you, if you want someone who has an incredible sense of humor, who likes to have fun and laughs more than I do, well, this is also the man. So ladies and gentlemen, it's an honor to have you with us tonight. The gallery, the gallery looks fabulous. I want to thank my sons and partners, Matthew and Mark. The beautiful Sonia is not with us tonight. 
we had a lightning problem at the house and her computers went down in the midst of something crucial to our business and she's over there slaving. Those of you who know Sonia can attest to those who don't know Sonia, she's bright, she's beautiful, she's wonderful. And if she's watching on the internet, I love you, baby. <laughs> Thank you for helping. That's called brown nosing among men. You know what I mean. But you know what? Here it is. Here we are. And here is Dean Mitchell. And I'll let him tell you uh, what he feels about this collection that he's brought to us. And perhaps there'll be a few questions that could be answered. And uh, without any ado whatsoever, my dear friend, a wonderful artist, Dean Mitchell. Thank you, man. <laughs> break the ice there a little bit. Welcome to the gallery. Um, first of all, uh, it's it's nice to be back in St. Augustine, and it's nice to be back with Cutter and Cutter. They always do such a great job representing my work, and I deeply appreciate it. And uh, I love your staff, and I love the fact that it's it's a family-owned business. It's a family-owned business, which I also love. And so, uh, because I grew up with a grandmother who family was everything. The family was everything to her. Uh, and that's how I was raised. Uh, my first gallery experience truly was, believe it or not, was in, in our home. Uh, I got started you know, with a paint by number set and uh, <laughs> moved on and started doing my own paintings. And my grandmother and I would go to the five and dime store and we'd buy these paintings, we'd buy these, these reproductions and she'd let me take the reproductions out and put my paintings in them and put them up on the walls. And so this is how whenever people would come over, she would say, oh, look what my grandson did. And she was really, really so proud of me. And so for me, see, the home became truly what I paint about is people and a space. People and a space. And how those spaces define who we are and how we relate to the rest of the world. I grew up poor, though from an exterior standpoint, totally different on what's going on inside the space. So sometimes when you see a home that doesn't look as fabulous and as wonderful exteriorly, inside is a real home, a place where you feel safe, spiritually grounded, there's all kinds of things that go inside of the space. And so when I paint the landscape or the barn scenes, there is a lot of history in those spaces. The barns that I paint, the tobacco barns, I grew up working in those spaces. I grew up lugging tobacco, I grew up in the fields, and then I helped hang the tobacco in the, in the barns. And they would drive their back to tobacco out, then they would go to the, to the packing houses. And so you see these kinds of spaces for people who were not highly educated. This was the only thing that they had to do. This was in the rural South. And see, as a young man thinking that I want to be a painter, my mother, who out of the four children that my grandmother raised, said there is no way a black man could make a living selling pictures in America, that I would have to go to Europe. But look at here. <laughs> and here I am. I thought we were in Czechoslovakia. And so, there again, or is it, or or is it France? I mean, look at the relationship that I'm having with this family and, and the opportunity that it's creating for me because they were welcoming me into their home. This is their business, this is their place. This is how they live, this is how they express themselves to you. And in, and in that way, I have gotten to meet you. See, that would have never happened had I not been introduced to your space. So I am humbly and deeply appreciative of that. Wait. But this is what life is all about. I, Go on, man. I have to tell Jump you. Jump in there with me. <laughs> I have to tell you, folks, that the dinner was spectacular. I, I heard him speak kind of like he's speaking to us tonight. And I made up my mind probably within 10 minutes. I have to do business with this man, that was you. Also, I was supposed to remind you that Dean has just relieved that the accolades that you've received are well over 400, but why don't you, no, you want me to tell. Yeah. The Portrait <laughs> Society of America, the Portrait Society of America, the Portrait Society of America, just gave Dean a Lifetime Achievement Award. Wow. Yeah. 
And we're not even talking about tobacco bonds, which we're gonna hear about now. And maybe especially this one to our right. Thanks, Dean, I had to do it. <laughs> Sorry, man, it's all good. <laughs> Again, um, even, uh, you know, I've had a chance to visit with some of the collectors here who purchased my works, and we were talking about some of the portrait works that I've done, uh, some of the things that are a little bit more challenging that I've done over the years to, to invite conversations that are sometimes difficult conversations. Uh, this is what art does. Art should just not make you feel good. It should make you think. It should make you feel something. It should make you feel empathy for others should do a lot of things. A space does a lot of things to you. When I grew up, the way I grew up, I grew up in the segregated South, but I had a junior high school teacher who took us under his wing. So four, it was four, four black gentlemen that he took up under his wings. And believe it or not, during that time, we had no idea of what this gentleman was going through. And the only way I know what he's going through is because he's now part of a documentary I'm working on. And this white gentleman was called a nigger lover. I'll tell you that right up front. Not only that, but he was also hated by the black community because he was trying to help young black men. But see, this was a person who cared enough to care about young men who had a dream. And so when you see me, there are layers and layers of why I'm here. One of the first gallery owners that handled my work was in Panama City, he was a Hungarian immigrant. He didn't know me from a hill of beans. We drove up and down the panhandle and no one would take my work because I was African American because they were afraid that they would run off their clientele base. But without that person coming into my life and saying, I love what you're doing, I respect what you're doing, I think you're talented, I would not be where I am. If it wasn't for my grandmother pushing me, so when you see me, you see a whole community. You see a whole community. So the things that I paint, I have to be, as an artist, I have to be drawn to the spaces for a reason. They have to speak to me morally, spiritually, and the creative genius of, of man. When you look at artists, everything that we love, everything that we love, everything that we are, I cannot imagine the world without artists. I cannot. So when I see the arts get cut, and I see the funding get cut, sometimes I think people just haven't connected to it deep enough to understand the depth of what artists bring to us as a culture. Not just a culture, but new jobs, new ideas, new concepts, new ways of communicating. Art enriches us in, in a way that no other does. New medicines is all based on the creative imagination. We take the humanities out of our culture. I can tell you what you wind up with. When you remove the humanities, when you remove the humanities, you see more violence than you've ever seen. And you will continue to see it unless we put the humanities back in our schools. That is how we connect. It's our moral compass. Truly, the artist will reflect back what we become. And you can see that in their works. You can see that in their works. But my work, I'm here to say that there is hope for us, but it has to be through the arts. It has to be. It is a deeper way we connect. When I look at history, and how history was redefined it through music, through objects. We learn about civilizations. We connect the people that we never even knew through what they made and how they lived their lives. It will be no different when we are dust. So understand that when I paint something as a painter, I love you. I have no other reason. Thank you for coming. Well, those who know me know that I'm supposed to say something funny here now, but this is just exactly like the day I met you, Dean. 
whoever put us seated side by side at that wonderful dinner on that wonderful evening knew what they were doing. And I told the folks a minute ago that Dean can go beyond anything I could ever achieve in terms of, you love him, you do too. Yeah, yeah. Dean's wonderful children. I hope we always remember these words. I hope these words get repeated and heard over and over again. For my part, for our part, I, I, look, Dean's children are up here. I'm begging my sons, Matthew and Mark Cutter, to come up here and stand with us right now. <laughs> Just for a minute. I know, I know they, do, they don't like to take any of the credit for what we do. They are the backbone, they are everything. Without them, this, this cannot be here. They're not as good looking as you. <laughs> I did not expect Dean to say what he just said, but I want us to remember what we've just heard. And I want to tell you that I am committed to you, Dean, for life, for life. As long as you want to be with us, we will be with you. And I made my mind up instantly. And hearing you tonight, it makes me proud to be an art dealer. It surely does. It makes me feel good about my family, my sons, my beautiful wife who's home working because a lightning hit the computers and- Oh yeah, uh, you told me today. <laughs> I almost feel like, I, I wanna show a picture of Sonia because I know she's home. I wish she'd be on the internet, but like me, she doesn't do that stuff, okay? I understand that too. <laughs> Believe me. The work of Dean Mitchell is on the walls. It'll always be on our walls, as I said to Dean. But tonight, there's many special pieces here for you to take a look at. And I invite you to get with Dean Mitchell. I know he'd adore a chance to tell you, well, Dean, could I ask you to do this? You, you were talking to me about this barn, the barn yeah. that existed when you were in front of it. Would you honor us with some, some of your thoughts? And later on tonight, folks, when, whether we're on the internet in Czechoslovakia, France, or Yugoslavia, I don't know where it's going to go. But there are some pieces. There's an all-American piece over here that I, I invite you all to become acquainted with. I, I think it's a star of the show, no pun intended. But Dean, what were your thoughts on that day? If you, if you had a chance to look at the title, it's titled Slipping Away. Uh, this barn is actually in my hometown, and uh, it's, it's totally gone now. It was, you know, it was uh, destroyed partially by the hurricane. It was leaning so much over to the, to the side that the owner decided to, to totally destroy it. But I like it because of, if you've seen these barns, they're pretty massive. They're pretty massive structures, and they, there's a certain majestic and ominous power to them. And here it was in its frailness, almost like, an, you know, during my years when I was working in it was, in some ways, you ever see an athlete that's so fit that they can just do almost anything? The Barnes had that kind of, kind of power to them. And they were just powerful structures. Aside from that, the economic wealth in which they brought to Southern people in the South too. And, and it was, there's a lot of things tied up into this for me. And, and to see this this majestic giant building uh, sort of just slipping away was just kind of, in some ways, uh, there was a beauty, but there was a haunting quality to it, and there was a there's, and it's a massive space. So you, I'm thinking about who worked in it, how many lives were in there, and all kinds of things. So. You know, if you look at it, there's a lot of. Lynn wants to walk over to it. Yeah. <laughs> just fine. Just fine. Uh, Couldn't the, resist. The, the really interesting thing I like about uh, I like about it, aside from the aside from the exterior destructive part of it, is these little negative spaces in here. These little what I call kind of like air. Without that air, it feels really heavy. It's a has a sudden weight to it. But that one thing, sometimes when I'm looking at something, I'm looking at the negative spaces. But what's really interesting is you feel the, the overall detail of the wood, but it's very sporadic. It's, a, it's an interesting kind of energy to this work. It's very interesting. It's a haunting energy, but it's a, it's a very, there's a, a certain power to it that I think I, I hope I captured anyway.
and a lot of history. <clears throat> Dean, earlier you mentioned this piece. We talked about it, and the words are delightful. The space, the air, the weight. What about this piece here, which was a big surprise when it well, came in? Well, you know, actually, uh, when I when I look at something, uh, I had. Uh, I'd never been to China. My wife and I went to China, won some international award, and, and we had an opportunity to, to see Shanghai. And if you've ever been to Shanghai, it's like New York on steroids. I mean, it's just like there's skyscrapers everywhere. And what was interesting was you had all these huge uh, modern type buildings, and then you went to a certain uh, section of the town, and there was these quaint little buildings kind of sandwiched in around some of these huge massive structures. and the psychological aspect of wealth, and then there was not the wealth. It was like a, it was, it was very, it was an interesting kind of energy to go from, from one psychological space immediately into another, and it, and it puts your mind into a whole nother, a whole nother place. It's kind of like sometimes when I'm traveling, and uh, we've gone to beautiful cities, and then you walk two blocks down the street, and people are in, in utter poverty. And it, and it slaps you back into a kind of a, a reality. There's a reality. There's a reality check there. That sometimes you get used to a space and you're so comfortable in it, and then suddenly you thrust it into another space, and you're totally caught off guard. You're almost slightly uncomfortable. You're almost slightly out of balance. And I like that because, in some ways, uh, it keeps me grounded from the space in which I emerged. And when I go back to those places and I visit those places. I recognize how fortunate I've been and how blessed I've been able to merge out of those spaces. And at the same time, I'm also drawn back into those spaces because that is the space in which I emerged and how I became who I am. And without that sensibility, this beauty that you see now would never be because I would not have empathy for those spaces to bring them to you, closer to you. So in that way, I am giving the voiceless a voice through the space and structures that they occupy and the energy that they bring to a place. When I go to the city of New Orleans or any place, sometimes I see some of these musicians. They're not very wealthy people, but the joy and the energy that they bring to a space that you walk through every day and enjoy their music. But you have no idea the homes they emerge from or any place about their spaces. But when you go there and you study it intimately, you get to see those places and you get to know those places. So you are not so threatened by them and they're not so threatened by you. So for me, we all occupy this one planet. We all occupy this one planet. I think we all want the same things. We want better families. We want safety for our children. Even the poorest of us want nice things and better things for themselves. Sometimes people are trapped within those spaces. They don't know how to emerge from them. I have family members like that. So I can relate to that. So if I go back, hopefully I will bring a different kind of energy, a different kind of sensibility about the world because when you travel, you travel, you reconnect to those spaces totally different. Those spaces become something different to you. They become something totally different to you. So that's what, that's what art's about. <clears throat> Somebody just told me I forgot to mention Canada. They're not that far away. Yeah. Okay. Oh yeah, I'm sure. <laughs> Thank you. My friends love they know my they know my sense of humor. They know the way I am. But they're getting to know you more, just like I did that evening. I'm gonna ask you for a couple of more instances. And kids, I know you're proud of your daddy, right? Did you love what he said? Everyone in this gallery loved what your dad just said. And I hope you hear these words into the future, well into the future. And you'll love what your dad said. And you will love what your dad creates. And I'm going to ask him to talk about this one and the St. Augustine piece. And then you know where I'm going to finish. Right in the middle. Would you do that, Dean, please? Um, I was talking to some collectors early about the work. I, uh, for a number of years, I've been invited to a lot of shows out west at the uh, Autry, the Masters of the American West at the Autry, and then there's one in Oklahoma City. There's a lot of different fine art shows out in the west. And uh, I was very struck by the, the romanticism of, of the west. But uh, I was in a show in, in, at the Phoenix Art Museum called West Select that was put on by a curator by the name of Jerry, Jerry uh, West. What was it Jerry? Jerry Smith. 
Jerry Smith. I'm uh, Jerry West. Yeah. I'm like thinking West here. Uh, uh, Jerry Smith. And uh, he wanted a more, uh, he was looking for artists who were interested in engaging the West in a more modern sensibility. And so I was, uh, I have a friend out there by the name of Michael Swearingen, and he just kind of, you know, just asked me, he said, have you ever been to a reservation? And I said, no, I've, I've, never, I've never been to a reservation. And so he took me at, right outside of Phoenix, slightly outside of Phoenix, to the, Mar the Pima Maricopa Reservation. And these were some of, the, some of the spaces out there that I saw. And it was very interesting as we, as we were riding around, and he said something about, he said something about poverty. And he said, oh, man, look at the poverty. I said, yes, let us look at it. Let us look at it with our eyes fully wide open. These are the indigenous people of this country. Let us look at it. Uh, let us not turn from it. Let us look at it. I said, and this is what I shall paint. Though these, though these reservation paintings have not been well received in the West with the rest and collectors, I can tell you right now, when they see them, they stop in their tracks. They do look at them, and they do examine those spaces. And for me as, a, as an artist, it's not up to me to make you feel good. It's up to me to make you see the humanity of these people and what they have gone through and what they have endured for generations. And so these spaces are more than just old buildings. They are psychological spaces. I remember having one of them in the Phoenix Art Museum and a very finely, finely well-read lady comes over to me, finely dressed. You could tell that she was a person of, of great means. And she was on, she was discussing the painting with me and how haunting it was and how, how it made her feel. And I said, imagine if you had to come out of this and see it every day, the real physical space. I said, you're experiencing something, something emotionally and it's a painting on the wall, but you're in one of the most finest built museums in the world, right here in the Phoenix Art Museum. And you're uncomfortable in a space and you're just looking at it. So imagine being in that space every day and coming out of that space and trying to figure out how I'm going to feed my family, how I'm going to close them, how are they going to feel safe when they walk out the door. There's all of these questions that they have to deal with on a daily basis, and here you are of great means, obviously, and you're uncomfortable. I love that. That is great. I am creating some empathy in to you about the space. She bought the painting, by the way. <laughs> yeah, and the museum bought two of the paintings. Uh, I got the top prize for, for a painting, but they also bought a painting. And so I begin to realize the power of art and how it pulls you in and makes you empathetic toward other people's situation. This is how you want to stop all the violence? It can be done. Mm -hmm. It can be done by not being greedy and showing some empathy and compassion. Because I can tell you right now, no one, no one on this planet picks the space that they are born into. We do not choose our parents. We do not choose the region in which we are born on this planet. You are just here and in a space. And if you can recognize that, you can, you can begin to recognize some empathy and recognize this too. You will not live forever. You will not. You will not. As much as we'd love to, <laughs> we will not. We are frail, we are fragile, and we will die, people. But we can die with honor and with goodness and with kindness. Kindness is more powerful than hate. It takes a lot less energy, and you float through the world a lot lighter when you love and you give back. But when you take and you, and you pull and you pull, you got to lug all that around with you. you got to lug all that around with you. But if you travel, and if you have acquired something, and you travel, and you create a certain empathy, you will want to give back. You will want to make the world better. You will want to see people thrive. You will want to see people learn different things about each other. You will want that naturally. You will want that. For me, I know that's what I want. I work even harder now that I have children. <laughs> I work harder because I want them to have a better life. I, don't, I want less violence. That can be done. 
but it has to come through the humanities. You cannot escape that. I don't know what they're teaching as far as humanities should be taught, just like math and science and English and everything else. Because that feeds the soul, people. Believe me, it feeds the soul. And our souls need to be fed. You can't just eat junk forever. You gotta, you need some real substance. You need real substance to grow. And you need hardship to grow. You need hardship to grow. Believe me. Sometimes you see people, they just floating through their life. They're just floating. And then suddenly, there's something that grabs them and changes their life for the rest of their life. Something tragic or whatever it is will change them. It will change them, and sometimes you'll see them, they'll get more involved with things that they never got involved with. But sometimes, and that leads to something more enriching than they ever thought would happen. Sometimes it's painful, but you grow through pain. You grow through it. Believe me. This country is growing through pain right now. They're growing. We're going to get there. We're going to get there, people. We're going to get there. Believe me. We're going to get there. So, anyway. And then, you want me to talk about my mom? No. Yeah, we're going to end there, Dean. Here's what... Here, oh, uh, oh Lynn's got something else. He's pulling, out. He's pulling another rabbit out of the hat. In I don't know which Canada, one. In Canada, the rabbit out of the hat. Would you briefly tell us about this St. Augustine piece that you brought such yeah, I, you know, energy first, to? First of all, um, I grew up, you know, I, you know, I'm all about a psychological space. And believe it or not, I'm, I am attracted to churches. I will admit that. I just am. I'm attracted to them. Uh, and I think part of it is, you know, first of all, as we know, St. Augustine is the oldest city in the United States. But so there's a lot of history. But aside from that, you know, for me, uh, the church was sort of a, a kind of a moral compass for me in a lot of ways. Uh, now, I know that there's different denominations with religion and all kinds of stuff. Of course, as you get older and you, and you learn more about religion, you, you get a different, broader sensibility about the world. But for me, I did learn a sense of right and wrong in, in, these, in these places. Uh, I also learned not to judge people. You know, I, I, you know, I, I am really, uh, I, I don't judge people because uh, I just met my, I met my father uh, when the kids were, were just born. My dad is in his 80s now. He was never in my life and anything. Rode by our house and nice cars, not, never stopped. I've met my father. I don't hate my father. I don't dislike him. I have nothing against him. I've met him. He's a wonderful man. My kids love him. Uh, I could have easily walked away from that way for met because he didn't have anything to do with me and help me and do anything. They even bought me a, a t-shirt, even as much as a t-shirt. But what good would that do for me not to like him? I don't know him. I don't know what made him who he was or who he became and why he did what he did. But believe it or not, the church gave me that, that sense. Uh, and so when I come into an area like St. Augustine, I am looking at all of that history uh, and we, as we all know, any religion also has its other, other sides. But I will look at something and I will try to extract the good of it. And I will build on the good of it, what I think is good for my soul. doesn't mean everything that they say I think is right. Or, you know, but I pull from it what I think is good and will lead me further into building a better life for myself. And hopefully... When I travel the world, I will have a, a sense of place and people and, and try to understand people and where they're coming from. So a church gave me that. Uh, not, a, not, a, not a place of judgment, but a, but a moral compass. Uh, and so, uh, and, and this is my mom. I'm going to tell you about my mom. Uh, uh, I, uh, I didn't grow up with my mother. She, uh, uh, my grandmother raised me. I always see my mother maybe once or twice a year, and sometimes on Christmas, sometimes during the summer months. Uh, and so I never had a really, really close relationship with my mother. But over the years, uh, since she's moved to Tampa, we've gotten closer. Uh, and um, it's funny because uh, people will see all these paintings of my grandmother, and they say, well, you never paint your mother. You never paint your mother. You know, people, you know people are people are very, very interesting. And I said, well, you know, I'm getting to know my mom, and I, I am the kind of person I, I, I have to feel something. And so I've gotten very close to my mother, and over the years, uh, I've, I've started doing a series on her, and this is, this is just one of those. But now, uh, she has dementia, and I've, been, I've done a whole series, I'm doing a whole series on her. 
Uh, and so it's turned into a very enriching and endearing relationship for me. And my mother is 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 a very uh, interesting person. I try to you know try to get a little bit out of her sometimes. Sometimes she'll give a little, and sometimes she won't won't tell me a lot of details about things. Well, she's a very very interesting person. But now uh, I feel closer to her, and I don't know if it's because she's almost uh, she's almost childlike now and, and very sweet in a lot of different ways. Uh, and uh, it's it's so interesting because my my mother was the first out of my grandmother's four children to get an education, so there is this deep affinity I have for what she achieved as a, as a woman of color, just going to college and getting an education, and and I don't know the layers of complexities of what she went through to achieve what she did, but it's it's just you know I'm having a I'm I'm having an interesting wonderful time painting her and seeing people's response to her. Uh, so, and again, it's, it's also not just for me, it's to share my story, and it's also to leave something for my children. Uh, it's, it's turned into an interesting thing because she has dementia and a form of Alzheimer's and that kind of thing. It's also, again, you know, I remember my mother when she was, you know, she would come, she would come home uh, during the summer and she had these, <laughs> she had these styrofoam heads. <laughs> Well, they had these star phone heads. She had these different wigs, different colored wigs. And she wore heads. Really, really, you know. And so, I, I, when I see her now, I think about all the memories and different things about her as well. So there's, there's a lot that, that, uh, and sometimes she'll look at me like she's really like, she's not really happy with me. You know? I kind of like that about her. She's, she's pretty honest with how she looks at you. Sometimes she don't say anything, but you know she's not really happy with the way she just looks at you. Uh, so it, you know, I don't know it is. <laughs> <laughs> but, I, I, but, but I'm really enjoying these, these, these interesting paintings of her when, when that she has dementia because uh, there's, there's, there's an innocence about people, I don't know, as, as we age, I don't know what it is, but there's a purity that starts emerging that we didn't have in our youth. Because in our youth, it's all about us and what we want. And then as you get older and, and frail and sometimes... You almost need people like a child again, all over again, and so there's a different kind of kind of energy that is both wonderful and and sometimes hard to see, but also challenging you in a different way with your own sense of humanity. It's a humbling thing to see someone slowly slip away. It, it's it's very haunting and very interesting to me as a painter. Because I know someday I too will be in that space. And how will my children handle that moment? Uh, and so, but at the same time there is this haunting beauty about it that captivates me. I don't know why, but it just does. <laughs> you know. Well, I've never, walk with me this way, Dean, and, and Scott, would you please come closer? I'm Dean, will you stand somewhere to my right over there? I've got to get some credit for what just happened, although I did nothing except recognize the moment I met Dean Mitchell that I was beside someone very special. I want you kids to know that. I want you to hear it. You are always beside someone very special. Your dad is an amazing person. He's a wonderful man. And I was talking to the folks, you might have heard me say, about his incredible sense of humor. And your dad and I have had some fun times on the phone. Oh, yeah, but tonight, <laughs> he went to the place that I've talked to you about. I mentioned to you that he has this, this side of him, this deep, intellectual, sensitive, powerful way that he conducts himself in his life. And I'm just going to repeat what I said a few minutes ago. I want the kids to hear this. The Cutter family and the Mitchell family will be connected as long as you want it to be. Is that okay with you kids? Yeah. All right. <laughs> Thanks for being here with us. Thanks for representing all of you. Thank you. And I need to impress you for last year. Come on. Join the show. Say something. Oh, come on. Get out of here. This is Bradford. Here you go, Dean. Yeah, speak right into the microphone. Wait. Uh, what, all right, you want to say something? Hello. It still works. Yes. Are you proud of your daddy? Yes. 
All right. Thank you. Thank you. I hope you all saw what I saw with those children listening to their daddy right there. Yeah. Oh, you want special. me to say it now like this? Mm -hmm. Thank you for joining us tonight. Thank you, thank you.